Welcome. What really interests me is the cosmology of the electric universe. Now, cosmology is supposedly the study of the structure of everything, the entire universe. But to most people of today, cosmology means only the study of the large-scale universe, black holes, galaxies, cosmic background radiation. And what is left out of such a cosmology is you and me and everything that we directly experience about the world. None of us has directly experienced the three-degree cosmic background radiation. All of us have experienced the feeling of sunshine and that strange beauty of flowers turning their faces towards the sun. The cosmology of contemporary science does not have a place for human beings, our sensations, thoughts, or feelings. Everything about life in the earth is considered an accident. The things that are most real to us throughout our day have absolutely no place in the cosmological discussions in the science halls of our universities. And this is a shame, because in its fullest meaning, cosmology must mean everything that we know about the universe. If you were to stand up in physics class at MIT and ask about the moral nature of the universe, you would be told that such questions are not cosmological. But this is wrong. Such questions are certainly cosmological. Having reminded us that true cosmology must include everything, we can now ask, is it important which cosmology I have? What difference does it make whether I have one cosmology or another? Do I believe that I live in an ordered world? Do I believe I live in a created world? Do I believe that I live in a meaningful world? All of these can be elements of my cosmology. And I propose that one's cosmology is of vital importance. It determines what I think is possible and what I feel is meaningful. It places me in the world. My cosmology determines the boundaries of my thought. When we look at the cosmologies of other cultures, we usually think that they are quaint stories told by ignorant folk to themselves. The collective memory of mankind seems not to reach past a few generations, so every age believes that it has the real bead on things. I propose that no matter how much we study other cultures, we never really understand their cosmologies. We never really fathom why ancient Egyptians covered temple walls in animal-headed gods, which the Egyptians never called gods, but always referred to as netters, which means something like a creative principle. We never really understand why in Europe for hundreds of years, people knew that this earthly life was only a short interlude between the larger realities of heaven, hell, and purgatory. In our time, whether or not we are scientists, we are all under the influence of a mechanistic cosmology, which for the past 300 years has been a cosmology of distance, time, impersonal forces of gravity and electricity, gigantic reaches of space without bound, we believe that the universe can be explained with equations. We believe that nature should yield its truths to us through carefully conducted experiments. We believe that time is linear and it flows from the past to the future, and that the past is gone and that the future does not exist yet. None of these beliefs are scientific facts. They are the cosmological framework in which we have scientific thoughts. And 1,000 years from now, people will wonder how we could have thought about the universe this way. Our mechanistic cosmology also has its contradictions, such as believing that the universe out there is dead and purposeless, but each of us is alive and has purpose. I have a PhD in physics, and I have done research and am published in radio astronomy, medical physics, and mathematics. I am no longer ashamed to admit that I cannot follow the details of string theory. I also admit that I was taught electricity and magnetism with way too much fancy mathematics. But I do know how to think, and I value others who can think clearly. And I also have a real love of Mother Nature. When I was first introduced to some of the ideas of the Electric Universe and the Thunderbolts projects, all kinds of bells and whistles were going off in my head and in my heart, because here finally was a set of scientific theories that fit within a satisfying cosmology. Consider the following diagram. The student of science sees many diagrams such as this these days. On the top, we have a distance scale going from the very small nuclear sizes 
all the way up to the large distant sizes of galaxies. Now, everything is on the same line. Now, that's quite an assumption to think that the length of an atom is the same kind of length as the length of a man or the length of a galaxy. In our current cosmology, we are justified in putting them on the same line because we believe the only difference is magnitude. Or with energies on the bottom, long radio wavelengths all the way up to the highest frequency cosmic rays, we put the hard gamma ray radiation of a supernova on the same line that we put that infrared warmth that we feel when we embrace one another. We assume, and the diagram shows us, that these frequencies are not of different kinds, but only of different magnitudes. Now consider a diagram such as this. <laughs> hmm. This is a very different cosmological statement. Galaxy is a world unto itself composed of solar systems. Solar systems are composed of planets. Planets have beings such as us on them, etc. Now, this is a very different cosmological statement. The inhabitants of this cosmology are not primarily known by a number, but by what they fit inside of and what is inside of them. This is not a new idea. I did not make this up. In fact, this is a very old idea. It is only in the last few centuries that Western science has come up with the notion that we can put everything on the same line or that we would even want to. The cosmology of the electric universe is much more like this second diagram. In the emerging ideas that all of us are here to discuss, there is a hierarchy of scales. A planet is not just like a star, only smaller and cooler. A planet stands in a specific relationship to a star. Take our sun and earth. We've all seen diagrams like this in our science books. Kind of hostile, isn't it? That poor little accident of an Earth being blasted by that dangerous solar wind. Good thing there just happens to be a magnetic field on the Earth that just happens to be the right strength to protect us. Now, here is a very different diagram of the Sun and the Earth. The previous antagonistic image is replaced by one of connection. Schematically, a simple electrical transformer Already, this is a completely different idea than a gravity-only picture of a dead rock circling a lonely fusion bomb. This is a new picture of an Earth intimately connected to the sun. It might even evoke ideas of the Earth playing a role in some sort of transformation of solar energies. Now, this is a cosmology that I can take seriously. Let us look more at the electrical connection between the sun and the Earth, starting on the surface of the Earth and working our way out. On a sunny day, there is a 100 volt per meter potential on the surface of the Earth pointing straight up into our atmosphere. Complete mystery. What is that doing there? Zooming out a little on the Earth, every second there are about 100 lightning strikes, each one millions of volts and tens of thousands of amps. Zooming out again, we see the lightning that we see is accompanied by newly discovered electrical phenomena that we've named jets, sprites, and elves that reach out into space. Pulling further out, we see the Van Allen belts, a ring of high energy protons at about 1.6 Earth radii, and beyond that, a ring of high energy electrons at about four Earth radii. And the northern lights are created as charged particles stream in through the north and south pole of this electric field. Pulling back a bit more, the Earth is rotating on its axis at 1,000 miles per hour and carrying in a circle that 100 volt potential, all the lightning, the jets, the sprites, and the elves, and all of that is moving through the solar currents at 60,000 miles per hour. From the surface of the Earth up to its orbit, that is some fairly complicated electronics. And you know what? There is a lot going on electrically that we have no idea about at this point. Now broaden this picture to include all the planets and comets of our solar system, each that has its own electrical nature that we are just beginning to understand, and that is some very complicated electronics. Scaling up again, in the electric universe paradigm, every sun, every star is transforming galactic currents. So as a little schematic, we picture current of some form coming from the galaxy and being transformed by the stars. And we must allow that stellar transformations of galactic energies are just as complex 
as what we are learning about the electrical transformations taking place in planets. Going up in scale again, each of these dots represents clusters of galaxies. We see that galaxies transform energies coming from, well, we're kind of reaching the limits of what we can talk about, but I would propose that galaxies transform the great currents and fluxes that course through our universe as a whole. Coming back to our own human scale, I do not consider it far-fetched to think of plants and animals and humans as transformers of energies coming from the Earth and the Sun. In fact, this is rather obvious, for how could we say anything otherwise than that plants transform sunlight and minerals into fruits, animals digest fruits and leaves, and humans eat it all? We all know there are electrical aspects to life. As we sit here breathing, in each of us, in every cell, and every mitochondria, billions of individual electrons are being guided down energy cascades to reunite with individual protons, forming hydrogen. And our mitochondria are harvesting the electrical energy into usable ATP. All cellular membranes maintain charge separations across their walls. We only move and think because of the flow of electricity in our bodies. If it were possible to stop the flow of charged particles and electric fields within us, our thoughts, feelings, and sensations would stop instantly. The 18th century research into animal magnetism was unfortunately stopped before it had time to develop. The study of the electricity of life lost a lot of ground because of that, especially in our understanding of the electrical connections between living organisms. But maybe now we can start and make up some of that lost ground and begin to study the electrical connections that exist between one living creature and another, or between every plant and animal and the earth, or between living creatures and planets, or even as the Egyptians taught, the possible connections between an individual man or woman and the sun. To reiterate the thesis so far, the electric universe points to or invites a cosmology in which everything is connected. Everything is part of a larger something and is composed of smaller somethings. The smaller constituents digest or transform the energies coming from the larger whole of which they are a part, and the larger whole benefits in many ways from all this transformation going on in its parts. Not long ago, another aspect of this new cosmology became clear as I was trying to explain some of these ideas to friends of mine. In the old view of things, the life history of a star is completely determined by its mass and how much mass a star has is considered completely accidental. We are told that stars that happen to have a large mass burn bright and quick and become black holes or supernova. Small mass stars are destined to live quiet lives, blow off a puff of gas of great beauty, and then go out slowly like cooling embers. In this old view, stars are locked into their fate entirely because of the amount of mass they just happen to have when they start fusion. Is there really nothing a star can do to change its fate? This might not seem like a scientific question, but I assure you it is. I was wondering about this old view while at the same time describing the EU views to my friends. The EU model, EU model says the brightness of a star is really a function of how much galactic current it is transforming. Bright stars are transforming a lot of galactic energy, dim stars transforming little. And I thought, it's like those functional MRI brain scans, where you ask a person to pick up a cup of coffee or solve a math problem, and all the neurons in the brain that are involved with picking up or thinking abstractly are lighting up because they are the ones doing the work. Those are the cells that are responding to the needs of the person. So maybe the stars that we see burning more brightly are actually doing more work for the galaxy. And the brightness is really more of a side effect, a consequence. The brightest stars in the sky are literally responding to some galactic need that requires more energy. And we can go one step further because we know some stars completely transform. These supernova that put out for a short time more energy than the entire galaxy. Now in the old view, this is an implosion of electrons and protons releasing fantastic amounts of energy. But in the old view, this transformation is an accident and is unconnected to anything else going on in the galaxy. 
But in the cosmology opening up before us in the electric universe, we can see that the supernova is a star that has taken a huge leap in its ability to transform galactic energies. And hence, I thought, a supernova is burning so incredibly bright because it has found a way to be that much more useful. The Crab Nebula was once an ordinary star doing ordinary work for the galaxy. And since we first saw it on Earth in 1054, it has been churning out prodigious amounts of super high frequencies. And we have no idea for how long this will continue. What is the purpose of these enormous energies and high frequencies? We do not know. But I do know that whatever a galaxy really is, not what our little minds think it is, but whatever a galaxy really is, these supernova play an important galactic function. In closing, let me say that I do not think that electricity explains everything. But including electricity in our explanations provides a much more coherent view than using gravity to explain everything. I personally think that as we continue explaining how galaxies and sun behave, we will need to be open to including other forms of energy beyond light and electricity. I also want to remind us all that hubris is one of the lowest places we can go to intellectually. Hubris, a form of arrogance, believing that I am right, believing that I have explained everything, being offended when my brilliance is questioned, believing that human understanding can penetrate the ultimate degrees of truth. All of this is hubris, and let none of us here fall to that level. And besides, hubris makes us all quite boring. <laughs> In this truly exciting conference, a lot that we are proposing might be totally wrong. But I know that a lot of what has been proposed is totally right. More right than things have been in science for many years. Welcome, let's have a great conference. Thank you.